Thank you. Uh, I'll be talking about risk stratification and treatment of ventricular arrhythmias in this challenging group of uh, patients. I have no disclosures uh, relevant to this talk. So in the next 20 minutes, we'll talk about current guidelines and certain high-risk groups which may not be present in the current guidelines. Talk a few minutes about device choices, which we heard already, but in this specific subgroup. And then probably in the last uh, few minutes, discuss ventricular arrhythmias treatment in this population. So a hypertroph we present to you in one of these clinical profiles. Luckily, most of them would end up in this area where they'll have a normal lifespan and a stable course. However, there are some dreaded uh, events which can occur in this population at an event rate of around 6% per year. And this, as uh, electrophysiologist and cardiologist, are our job to identify this uh, group of patients. So there are certain risk factors which have already been established, and we all know about them. This includes family history of sudden death, left ventricular wall thickness greater than 30 millimeters, unexplained syncope. The word recent here is five years. Uh, Non-sustained VT defined as more than 120 beats per minute, and abnormal blood pressure response to exercise. So if you have one of these, the current guidelines recommend various strength of recommendations for ICD implant. Uh, point to note, if you just have non-sustained VT or only abnormal blood pressure response and no other risk factors, it's a class 2B indication for ICD implantation. So how do these guidelines do? Uh, Doug Mahoney's group from Europe looked at both ACC guidelines and European guidelines, and this is the receiver operating curve for both. The red is the ACC guidelines and blue is the ESC guidelines. The area under the curve, 0.61, so not that great. So definitely there is some room for improvement. The reason being some risk factors either are not as robustly included in the current guidelines or are included as binary variables. Uh, one of them, for example, the left ventricular wall thickness. Nothing magical happens at 30 millimeter. It's a continuous spectrum. So the disease risk doesn't change from 29 to 30 millimeters. So it's a continuous gradient. So prescribing it as a binary variable in guidelines may be a little problematic. Um, so to overcome these uh, limitations, the Europeans tried to come up with a newer uh, risk prediction model. They had a retrospective multi-center cohort study looking at around 3,000 patients uh, from six centers across Europe. They were able to improve the C-index to 0.7, so this is their risk calculator. Some newer things in this is age, maximal LVOT gradient, left ventricular wall thickness. Here it's a number, so it's a continuous variable, and rest of the risk factors remain the same. So using this calculator, you'll get a five-year risk, and then you can stratify your patients as low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. Why did they include age? Because aging is not always bad, and in fact is very good in hypertrophs. So if you were first diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, when you were greater than 60 years of age, chances are even if you have one of those high risk factors, you're not going to die from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy related events. So considering an ICD in a hypertroph after 60 years may not be uh, as straightforward as uh, someone younger. So going back to the European risk calculator, which is now included in their guidelines, so you will get a five-year score, and if it's less than 4%, ICD not recommended, greater than 6%, ICD recommended. So how, how do these uh, risk calculator works in an American cohort? This was looked by Dr. Marin's group in his cohort. Turns out doesn't work that well either. So the green bar here are the lowest risk group. 
uh, risk calculator calculated their risk as less than 4%. And turns out they have the highest number of events in American cohort, both for sudden death and appropriate ICD shocks. So definitely some problem with that risk calculator. However, if we look at it carefully, I plugged in some numbers. So I took a patient who was, had a LV wall thickness of 30 millimeters, so would qualify for ICD according to American guidelines. Here, the risk, everything else I put in as normal. So risk of sudden death at five years, 2%, ICD not indicated. Uh, because here they assume that presence of multiple risk factors is additive, more you have, higher the risk. So if you just have one standalone, one risk factor, and everything else is normal, you probably are not at high risk. Turns out that's not true. This study looks at patients with more than one risk factors versus just one risk factors. Chances of having an event doesn't change. So if you have one risk factors, two risk factors or three risk factor, the chances of ha having an event remains the same. So which groups are we missing and how can we improve on this? Uh, LV apical aneurysm, this is a very important group of patients I'll talk about. Gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI and patients with mildly depressed EF. So left ventricular apical aneurysm is most commonly associated with mid-cavitary obstruction. It may occur in various shapes and sizes. You can see obviously very small aneurysms which are very easily missed on echocardiography to large aneurysm with clot in them. Event rate in this subgroup of population is very high. You can see threefold higher events if you have an aneurysm versus if you don't. And most of these events are arrhythmic events, some of them being thromboembolic events in those patients who probably have a clot in the aneurysm. This slide also shows their survival is poor with up to 10% uh, event rate per year uh, if you have a LV aneurysm as compared to if you don't. This is one of my patients uh, came with non-sustained VT and sustained VT both. At that time, he she did not have a defibrillator. We got an MRI, again, similar picture, may not project well, but mid-cavitary obstruction, large apical aneurysm, late gadolinium enhancement. She was taken to EP lab, and usually you see reentrant arrhythmias from the uh, apex. This patient, however, had a focal arrhythmia, so we published that case. Uh, you see a centrifugal pattern of uh, activation, a pre-systolic rather than a mid-diastolic potential, and was successfully ablated from apex of the LV aneurysm. So in patients with LV apical aneurysm, uh, event rate is high. We should have a high index of suspicion, especially if you see mid-cavitary obstruction, as this may be missed with echocardiogram and MRI is useful. Coming on to another use of MRI is late gadolinium enhancement. It has been well known for many years that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can have late gadolinium enhancement. However, the problem has been it is so common that to use it as a risk factor uh, is difficult. It's present in up to 70% of these patients. However, a recent study, which is a large study and may probably in the next version of guide lines may make it to one of the standalone risk factors is because this they had around 1300 patients uh, who had cardiac MRI extent of late gadolinium enhancement was associated with an increased risk of sudden cardiac death, hazard ratio 1.46 for every 10% increase in late gadolinium enhancement. A late gadolinium enhancement of 15% of LV mass demonstrated a two-fold increased risk even in absence of other risk factors. This is a Obviously, a survival curve. You see patients, if they have less than 10% LGE, their survival is same as almost those who don't have any LGE. However, as uh, the amount increases, your event rate goes up. It's not just arrhythmic events, more the LGE, you also have higher rate of progression to end-stage cardiomyopathy and total mortality also increases with the quantity of LGE. So 
cut off around 15%, uh, even in low risk group patients, may benefit from ICD even in the absence of other risk factors. The last subgroup is patients with mildly depressed EF. For hypertrophs, we know their EF is usually hyperdynamic, their EF is more in the 70, 80% range. So see if you see a burnt out cardiomyopathy, which these are called, their prognosis is very poor. 50% probably be dead in the next five years. So this high risk group of patient also needs to be identified and treated more aggressively, even in the absence of other risk factors. So coming on to the defibrillator choice, with the advent of transvenous devi uh, subcutaneous devices, and specifically for younger patients, as we discussed earlier, uh, we have an option of uh, using them in this population. The main skepticism or fear has been, will it be successful since they have a high LV mass? Some concern for T-wave oversensing and lack of ATP in this population. So uh, there was the effortless and ID cohorts. The, this was looked at, and a couple of studies have looked at it. This specific study had around 100 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and there was no difference in cardioversion acutely or the energy requirement for cardioversion in this subgroup of patients. So we know they work as well as in other populations. How about inappropriate shock rate? Inappropriate shock rate was also pretty comparable in the two, and we were and they were able to reduce the amount of inappropriate shocks by dual zone programming as for non-hypertrophs. So no difference in energy requirements or in terms of inappropriate shocks as comes to subcutaneous ICD. How about ATP? Uh, it depends how many patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will present with fast VT, VF versus uh, VT which can be treated with ATP. Turns out if you look at all arrhythmias, this study looked at all arrhythmias in patients with ICD who had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. One third of these episodes are for VT, while two third are for fast VT, which they label ventricular flutter and ventricular fibrillation. So one third of these episodes are amniable to ATP, and their success rate of ATP was quite good, approximately two third of patients. So it's a difficult decision. Uh, so to tease it out further, I guess if we can identify patients who will have uh, monomorphic and treatable VT, maybe prefer a transvenous device in them as compared to subcutaneous device. Some hints include patients with mid-cavitary obstruction like the one we saw earlier and apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This study looked at type of arrhythmia and most of patients with sustained monomorphic VT had either apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or midventricular obstruction. So I guess I will leave it at that, uh, it's a difficult decision, it depends on the age of the patient, and specifically if you have uh, what type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy probably should also play a role in that decision. Lastly, coming to management of uh, ventricular arrhythmias in this challenging population, the first case report was uh, in 1997. Again, a patient with LV apical aneurysm, a beautiful LV gram, they had monomorphic VT, uh, reentrant VT as opposed to the earlier patient I saw with good mid-diastolic potential. Ablation at this site was successful as seen in the lower graph. However, in this patient, the VT record the next day and eventually had to go for aneurysectomy, which is a good option for some of these patients. A uh, Couple of case series have been published. Uh, one is from Vivek Reddy's group. This had a total of 10 patients uh, from four Four centers, uh, seven patients had inducible VT. Some things to take from this study, most patients had either LV apical involvement, that was the most common location of scar, or it was in the anterolateral location. Epicardial approach was required in most of these patients also. The next case study, which is from Andre Natale's group, also included around 22 patients. Now this had, uh, again, required around 50% 
patients required epicardial approach. These are long procedure times, five to six hours, which is, uh, I guess, if you are going epicardial, you can expect a long procedural time. All arrhythmias don't arise from apex. This is an example from that study. You see a big lateral, basal lateral scar, uh, and a nice mid-diastolic potential, which was ablated. So management of ventricular arrhythmias, keeping in mind monomorphic VT is less common. Apex and anterolateral wall are the most common site of scar. You should be prepared for epicardial ablation as 50% of these patients would require it. Surgical myectomy and aneurysectomy can be considered if your transcatheter approach fails. If we manage these patients aggressively using ICDs in the select population, uh, alcohol ablation, transplant, they can have a normal lifespan. This just shows hypertrophs, event rate, mortality 0.5 comparable to general population. So in conclusion, risk stratification is complex, should be individualized. Improvement in imaging techniques have identified additional high-risk subgroups. Cardiac MRI with late gadolinium enhancement and T1 mapping should be considered in all hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. Choice of defibrillator depends on type of hypertrophy, age of the patient, and their preference. Ablation of VT in this subset is challenging and would often require epicardial approach. With appropriate use of current treatment modalities, most of these patients can achieve a normal uh, lifespan. Thank you very much. Given the different types of guidelines that mention things like wall thickness and syncope and family history, you, you bring up a good point that things like late gadolinium enhancement, LV aneurysms, EF less than 50, uh, you know, th maybe perhaps monomorphic VT versus other types are, are, are helpful things. Uh, do you think that those are the kind of factors that need to go into subsequent scoring to help with making clinical decisions and maybe some other factors as well? Yeah, so U.S. guidelines are 2011. I think this is some things the guideline writers would be grappling with in the next version of the guidelines, how to incorporate this new data from imaging. Uh, but I think definitely we need to consider them because event rates are as high as 10%. So you cannot ignore them even if you have other, if you are, don't have other risk factors. So right now you're having to consider those in the absence of guidelines, yes. but I think what you're saying is the data is, is looking more and more compelling. More and more robust, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? So what's your thought occasionally for symptomatic improvement with desynchronous pacing in some of these patients? I mean, there's no mortality, but when you're deciding between a transcutaneous or a transvenous, or a subcutaneous and a transvenous, does that factor in at all when you're thinking about it? Yeah, so not, so question is, are we pacing useful in reducing gradients? Um, Confusing results. Initially, it was thought that it can reduce the gradients to about 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters, uh, but hasn't panned out that well in other studies. Um, so it's a class 2B recommendation now uh, to use it for that purpose. But I think sometimes what happens is if they have significant gradient, you use a very high doses of beta blockers or sometimes even anti they have they have VT or on Sotolol or high dose beta blocker or verapamil, then sometimes there, I have seen that the heart rate is too low. They may need some help with the sinus node. So in those groups which have high gradients, maybe a select subgroup dual chamber may be helpful, but not just for reducing gradients, I think.